It's lovely to be here. I, I live in Scotland, but I'm technically not Scottish. I'm actually English. <laughs> I come from the east of England, a place called East Anglia. Um, that's where I grew up. And it's an extremely flat part of the UK. I don't know if anyone... Has anyone been there to the east of England? Okay, because I, I saw this nodding. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the first eight years of my life, I thought the countryside was like this. I had never seen a real hill. I thought the countryside was flat fields, usually growing uh, sugar beet, big you know, rooted vegetables making sugar. And I thought that rivers and streams were these drainage ditches, much like you might see in the Netherlands. That's the landscape I knew. When I was eight years old, my parents took me to the north of England to a, a place called Derbyshire, and it blew my mind. I, I never forget that moment of seeing, oh, land, land can be like this, and oh, <laughs> and it just made my heart sing. And that's partly part of the reason why I was drawn to go and live in the, in the, well, in a mountainous place in Scotland where there is rock, there is sea, and there is this heavy, weighty wilderness uh, where we've both chosen to live. My name is Sven Erik and I grew up in Glupstrup, just outside Copenhagen. My mother came from Ralingen, with Lillestrøm, and she went to Denmark to have the bite of an orange. That's very much the truth, because here in Norway, you were really suffering during the war. When my mother and my father spoke about the war, she always told him, Dere hade smør, dere. <laughs> End of conversation. No more talks. It was too, yeah. But, what I, but when I grew up, I grew up in this flat country called Denmark. I mean, the, the highest mountain is 173 meters high. It's a very flat country. And when I asked my mother, tell, tell us a story, mom. Ja, son. Nå skal jeg fortelle dere ei skrøne. Det var i gang i hørne, som satt på fossa hjørne. Så datt han i en kom, var ikke hun dum. Nej, mamma, en riktig historia. Hon lärde aldrig det danska språket. Hon gjorde aldrig det. Hon visste var det var att det var 95, 95, allt det visste hon. Men hon hade den här klara tonen av norsk. För hon älskade fortfarande in till hennes dödsdag det här hem som hon kallade Norge. What did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I told them about my mom who loved that still after 50 years she still loved the c her home country. Oh, Norway. yeah. Yeah. Um So we we've been invited to share our foreigners perspective on Norwegian stories. Quite a challenge actually because uh, oh yeah, I'm a foreigner. I'm a foreigner here. Okay, so what is that? And I thought, okay, well, what's, what's the earliest Norwegian story I ever learned? And there was a story from my childhood, which I didn't even know at the time was a Norwegian story. I just assumed it was an English story, a story that everybody knew. My mother would tell me at bedtime, everybody knew the tale of the three billy goats gruff. Three goats which lived in a meadow. And one day, well, there was a big goat, there was a middle-sized goat, and there was a baby goat. And their name, as far as I know, was the three billy goats gruff. And one day they discovered they had eaten all the grass in the meadow where they lived. And the little billy goats gruff said to the middle billy goats gruff, Oh, what are we going to do? We have nothing to eat. And the middle billy goats gruff said, Yes, I don't know what we're going to do. There's nothing to eat. And the big one said, Look over the water. There is a lush green meadow. Let's go there. Oh, but under the bridge there is a troll. Yes, under the bridge there is a troll. Don't worry, said the big billy goat scruff. Let's go one by one. We know what to do when we get there. And so the little billy goat scruff said, I will go first. Came to the bridge and it began to cross. Trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap. And suddenly there was a 
and out from under the bridge. A troll jumped onto it. <laughs> and the little billy goat scruff tried not to show it was scared. Who's the trip trapping over my bridge? It is I, it is little billy goat scruff. Ooh, well, you're not allowed to cross my bridge. But I want to go and eat the grass in the meadow over there. <laughs> I will eat you first. Oh, no, you don't want to eat me. In just a moment, middle Billy Goat Scruff will be crossing the bridge, and, well, he's much bigger than me. You get more meat. Let me cross. Oh, more meat. Mm. All right, then, all right, then. Trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap. And little Billy Goat Scruff began to eat all the delicious grass in the meadow. It was middle Billy Goat Scruff turn to cross the bridge. Trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap. <laughs> Who's that trip trapping over my bridge? It is I, it is middle Billy Goat Scruff. Mmm, middle Billy Goat Scruff with more meat. <laughs> Now I'm going to eat you! Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, big Billy Goat Scruff is coming in just a moment uh, to cross the bridge. Uh, there's much more meat on him. Oh, big Billy Goat Scruff. More meat! <laughs> and middle Billy Goat Scruff went to the meadow and began to munch on the grass. Then it was Big Billy Goat Scruff turn. Trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap. Who's that trip trapping over my bridge? It is I. It is Big Billy Goat Scruff. <laughs> mm, with more meat. <laughs> well, Big Billy Goat Scruff, now I'm going to eat you. Uh, the Big Billy Goat Scruff simply looked at the troll did a bit of this with its front hoof, put its head down and charged. Sticking its horns into the troll, it flung the troll far, 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 far away. And that troll was never seen again. And the three billy goat scruff lived in that lush green meadow until the rest of their days. That's the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> As a story that's in my bones, because it was always told to us. Every child in England knows that story. Um, and throughout my childhood, well, trolls only existed in that story. I didn't know there were trolls anywhere else. That was the only troll that there was. <laughs> and it's all about nature. Mm. Troll is about nature. When you go into a forest in Denmark, you will have like, if you walk for half an hour, then you're in the middle of the forest, and then you have half an hour, and then you are out of the forest, more or less. <laughs> but if you go into a forest here in Norway, you will go into the forest, and then after a day or two, you will find out, maybe I'm a little lost here. <laughs> and what's going on, where is sort of the end of whatever it is, is maybe I'm in Sweden, and then you can go all the way, whatever. But it's the nature, that's something outside of yourself. And one of the words that I learned from the people of Norway, that they always said with, with I have a lot of family, my mother had 10 sisters and brothers. So there is a lot of cousins going on. Yeah, yeah, sis, can you want it? Aha. I didn't know. I mean, who? I don't know. But anyway, <coughs> when, 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 when you go into um, a forest here, in the, the whole thing about nature and the connection with nature is the word fjell. When, when you say the word fjell, vi ska på fjell, and there's so much love in it. It's just, just go, ah, that's where you can relax, there where you can sort of take away this civilization thing and just go, you're out there in the nature and you're calm and you're quiet. And then I started uh, looking for stories, and one of the stories that I really enjoyed telling, it's actually just as 
horrible as this story. It's about this little boy who's coming out into the forest. He's the third of three brothers. And he meets this troll, and the troll is much bigger than him. But they start challenging each other, right? You know about squeezing the stone? And he actually has a cheese, and he just drips, drips, drips. And he throws one stone, and actually a bird going fly, 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 fly. And then he says to the troll, OK, let's eat then. I can win over you there. But he has a bag. So he just puts it in the bag and puts it in the bag. And the troll goes, you can eat a lot, little man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> and more. And mo a little <coughs> mm, nice, nice, <laughs> nice, 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 nice. And then the troll said, I, I, I'm, I'm getting full now. No, 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 come on, come on, eat, eat, eat. And then he takes off a knife. And he cuts it into this bag and sort of, and all the porous just floats out on the table. It's kind of a disgusting image, but it's not over yet because the next picture is just really, really horrible. Because the troll goes like, can you really do that? Yeah, of course you can. You can just, and then you can eat again. <laughs> I have to do that. I have to try it at least. dead troll. <laughs> I mean, they all die. Nature is like something you have to fight in a way. And then he goes down and finds out there's lots of treasures. And he goes home to his mom and dad and says, well done. You killed a troll. You have all this. Oh, now we're rich for the rest of our lives. It's more or less like that. But nature, I think, is a key word with trolls and the stories of Norway. It's true. And, uh, I got a real sense of, I've never been to this country before, by the way, and it's just amazing. And we were lucky enough to be forced to take the train from Oslo to Trondheim, and the weather was beautiful. That journey, whew, it just broke my heart. It was so, so beautiful. And I got this real sense of the, the power of nature in this land. It's overwhelming you you just have to surrender to it and of course when i see it and i feel it of course there's trolls there right of course you can feel them they the whole place vibrates with all these these beings these possibilities but we would really like to know what trolls mean for you so for the next moment for the next few minutes could you f just speak to somebody next to you and talk about what trolls mean for you? You have a couple of minutes. Yeah. Well, I'm actually going to tell tomorrow we're going to do a performance called Giants, and we're working right now. It's we're sort of finishing the story. It's a little <laughs> panic, but it's going to be <laughs> all right tomorrow. And it's about how the we folk of Scotland, and the we folk, we in Scottish means little <coughs> and they are powerful they are really really powerful you have to really take care of if you live close to a, one of the wee folks you just respect them and honor them because else <coughs> it takes you into a very dark place cows dies everything goes wrong you can't have babies it's just horrible so be kind to the wee folks because they are powerful they're very strong North like mythology? Yeah. You want to say something to the group? No? I, th I th thank you for, <laughs> for, <laughs> for uh, yeah, I've learned a lot from you this morning. So <coughs> this is my foreigner's perspective. I, it's actually to just, okay, what do you know? <laughs> what, what can you tell me? What can you feed me with? Yeah. Yeah. And you would like to continue? Yeah, I would like to continue with the story. I, um, when I started telling stories, it was because I started on a Folkehøjskole in Denmark. In 1994, I was, I was doing a lot of theater in Namibia and Africa. I was doing a video of my father. So I was kind of out there doing art and stuff like that. But I was engaged as a Højskolelærer. Anyone has Højskole? 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 Nils Frederick Severin Grundvi wrote in the preface of Nordic mythology from 1832 that 
to learn about a people, the youth of the people, the dreams of the people, you have to go into the oral stories. I think that's quite powerful. You can go into the written, that's sort of very mature, very sort of like me, old man, very, I know a lot, but I don't have the power of the youth, right? Ask how, how anyone who's a young, they have this dream. It's going to be. I can look back on my life. They are going to do something. And if you want to know about the future, the dreams of the future, the dreams of the youth, you have to go into the oral storytelling. That's why he looked into the Norse myths and said that you can actually caught a glimpse of the Nordic people when they were young and had these big grand visions. And he created a school on freedom for Loki as well as for Thor. So Loki, as we know, as a trickster, you have to respect him as you respect Thor, who's a fighter. Who's a but there's one thing, as we learned during this winter, we had um, <coughs> a series of conversations about the Nordic mythology with a group of people. It was actually during, yeah, it was, uh, doesn't matter. For the last year, we've been having this discussion. And there were quite a lot of young women there. And they said, it's quite a nice vision, but there's one very clear thing that's missing. Thor, Loke, Loke, Thor, they're all men, right? And it's Odin, and it's Loke, and it's blah, blah, blah. Where are Idun and Freya in that picture? So now it's maybe time to make another school, to make another foundation built on some of the Vayners and some of the Valkyries, you know what, what they're called? The Vulva. Vulva. Maybe it's time. We're still working <laughs> on that sentence that sort of <laughs> include all these veiners and everything. But when I came to Scotland, and one of the reasons I came to Scotland was because my life was really in a deep hole. I have a turning point there. <laughs> I went to Scotland, and I, I went into the storytelling center in Edinburgh. I met this wonderful woman. I was scared of heights. We went <laughs> on to the plateau in front of the castle. And I said, I don't want to go there. And Alice just said, hold my hand. <laughs> and I went down into this beautiful Princess Street garden and everything. So I started telling some of these stories, Nordic myths. And I discovered that Thor, they called him Thor. You know, with a <laughs> Thor. And I was going like, why? Why why do you need that sound? <laughs> why why can't you just call him Thor? I mean, come on, what's that for? But anyway, they love these stories. They have them right into their bones. It's just like the the uh, the, the three billy goats gruff. Yeah, it's just it's it's kind of in their bones now. So when I started telling once upon a time there was a god called Tor, they go like, yeah, I got that, <laughs> hammer, <laughs> ah, right? But I, then I say, it's not, the handle is not that big. It's kind of part of the whole story, is that the dwarves was pricking on, so they made the handle like this. That's kind of okay that you say Tor, but I say Tor. Is that all right for you? Yeah, and then they go. And he was out fishing, you know, with a giant. He was out fishing. And he had a big bull's head <laughs> and a big hook into that head and he wanted to fish something very big. The giant fished a whale and another whale and a seal and a boob and the Thor said, no, no, it's not good enough. We need something bigger. And the, and the giant said, now we, we're far enough, far away from the shore. No, no, we have to go into the middle of the ocean. And then at the middle of the ocean, he took the bull's head attached to a rope and then he felt it, this big snake coming, <laughs> swallowing this bull's head and torches pulled. And now he started pulling this big snake that's all around the world. And the kids were just going, wow, we know about this. We know Tor, we know his strength, we know that. But what they didn't know was that the giants 
was really scared. He has pissed on him like he's scared. <laughs> he was so scared. <laughs> and he had a knife, so he cut the rope. <coughs> and of course, Thor was so angry. What was his first thought? Right? The grab the hammer. And he had tried that with the uh, snake, but it wasn't coming over the, the surface of the water. It just went down there. But he was looking at the giant. But there was something then, because the giant was actually his host. And you can't kill a host, right? You're kind to a host. So he put it back, and then he rode into the shore and left the giant alive. Very, very seldom that Tor meets a giant where he doesn't kill it. And that story resonated clearly with these Scots boys and girls. It's kind of a very much a boy story, isn't it? <laughs> There's not a lot of girls' power in it. But anyway, it was really great to see that Tor is, I think it's in the world now, right? Thor, not Tor, not Thor. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> the children really know about him, and he's in, he's in all the computer games, he's in all the movies, it's just there. And I hope that that's a gateway for children to really dive into these old, old stories, even if they're not told, perhaps, in the depth we would like as storytellers. Um, my challenge today was to come <laughs> to you with a foreigner's perspective on Norwegian stories. That's an enormous <laughs> challenge. I don't know what that is. Um, I, yeah, and who am I to tell you what your stories are, too? Um, I don't know. I really don't know. But what I do know is there was once a tree, a big tree that grew all the way through nine worlds. I know that the top of that tree stretched up into the world of the gods. I know it had roots sinking down, down into other worlds. I know one of those roots stretched far, far, far away to a place called Jotunheim, which I believe is just down the road from here, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing to be so close by. And, th and that one root was drinking from a well there. And I know that in that well there were waters which were full of wisdom. They held the knowledge of all that came before and all that was yet to come. And guarding that well was a giant whose name was Smumir. Now you have to forgive my pronunciation because I learned it from this man and, well, <laughs> who knows if he's correct or not. <laughs> Mumir would drink from the waters of wisdom every day. He was full of those, that wisdom. Perhaps information about this just traveled up this route, all the way up the trunk of that tree, up into the world of the gods, and perhaps it was the leaves in the canopy of that tree that whispered, whispered to Odin, there's this well, it's full of knowledge full of knowledge of all that came before and all that's yet to come. And Odin was like, oh, I want some of that for myself. He'd, he'd already hung for nine days and nine nights in the branches of the tree to get the wisdom of the runes, these strange markings in stones. Ah, he'd learnt that magic, but if he could have the knowledge of all that had come before and all that was yet to come, that was something for him. And so he journeyed down from the world of the gods over the rainbow bridge through the world of the humans, across the sea, to the edges of the land of the giants, is what we can call it in English. Jotunheim. Harsh place, a cruel place. Dusty, sandy, weather that was either too hot or too cold. Winds that picked up that would blast the sand in his face like swarms of biting insects. He pushed through those harsh, harsh climbs. On and on he went, motivated by the only thought that he would have this knowledge. He journeyed over mountains, over rocks. Everything he put his hand on seemed to hurt. 
The rocks were harsh, they were cold. Every place he stepped his foot, it was as though it cut into his feet, but still he went on. Up, down, up, down, over, under, through, until finally he saw it. There below him, just a stone's throw away, there was the giant, Mumia, actually his uncle. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, his mother's brother. <laughs> and he began to approach. Mumia just looked up. He knew his nephew was coming. All he had to say was, there is a price if you want to drink these waters. I'm willing to pay it, uncle. Are you sure you are willing to pay it? What is the price, uncle? The price is your right eye. Ordin took a sharp breath in. He sensed his right eye. He looked at all that was around him. He took in every color, every shape. He fed that eye with all he could. And then he took a small knife from his belt. He put his hand over the right eye. <laughs> he pulled out the eyeball. He cut the optic nerve. He handed it to his uncle. His uncle swelled with pride. He nodded towards the waters, and Auden tossed the eye in. The eye sank down, down into the well, and it lodged itself on a little rock that was jutting out. It was looking straight back up. Mumir still said nothing. He just scooped the great horn into the waters and handed it to Auden. And as Auden drank, he felt his body filling up with the coolness of that knowledge. It first arrived in his stomach and then spread through his body, the knowledge of all that had gone before and all that was yet to come, filling him. Can you imagine that, filling you? Every thought, every sensation, every event that had ever occurred, every feeling, every emotion, every single thing that had gone before and that was yet to come. Swarms of visions, smells, sights, sounds, tastes. When he had finished his drink, he stood for a time, waiting, waiting until he could hold it all. And when he was ready, he thanked his uncle. He turned, he made the journey home, over the mountains, across the plains, over the sea, through the world of the humans, up the rainbow bridge, back to the world of the gods, with the knowledge of all that had come before, all that was yet to come. And the next thing to come was war. But that is another tale for another time. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.